Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much, everybody, for making it through the wind and the dark to join us here tonight. My name is Rachel Guberman-Hill, and I'm your host for this evening. I'm here to welcome you to the 10th Elizabeth Blackwell Institute Annual Public Lecture. And I'm absolutely delighted that this year our lecturer is going to be Professor Patricia Kingori. So before I introduce Patricia to you, I'd just like to say a few words about house housekeeping, a few words about Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, and then I'll go on to introduce you to Professor Kingori. So the housekeeping for tonight is the usual set of things that we have to go through. So we're not expecting a, a fire alarm tonight by way of a test. So if a fire alarm does go, please make your way in an orderly fashion out of this room, go out through the front door, turn right, and then please gather by the cathedral. The toilets are multifold in this building. There's ladies loose that way down some stairs. There's gents loose that way down the corridor. And you'll find accessible toilets at both ends of the corridors. If you need first aid or any other help, please identify staff of the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute um, through these red lanyards that we're all wearing. We've got a photographer here tonight. He's called George. He's over here. If you would prefer not to be included in photographs, please speak directly to George. We're planning on publishing some of the photographs online on our website. A huge thanks to our British Sign Language interpreters who are joining us tonight for the whole event. They are Julie and Naomi. Julie and Naomi, I know how much work it is to do BSL, so thank you so much in advance for all of your work. <laughs> Um, we also, we like, to, <laughs> we, we like to thank our speakers at these events using silent applause. Silent applause looks like this and we find it to be inclusive, noise free and joyful. So at some point later today I will signal to us that we're doing silent applause for our speaker. Now this annual public lecture honours the memory of Dr Elizabeth Blackwell. And the lecture itself is hosted by the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute for Health Research at the University of Bristol. As an institute in the university, we support and we nurture health research across the whole university and also in the partnerships that we hold as a university with external organisations, groups and fantastic individuals too. And as an institute, we host this annual event as a way of memory, remembering and doing honour of honouring Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. She was a daughter of Bristol. She was born here in our city in 1821. So it seems really fitting that this lecture is held tonight in the beautiful City Hall. Dr. Blackwell grew up near what's now Cabot Circus. She was born at 1 Wilson Street and she lived in Bristol until she was 11 years old. When she was 11, she and her family moved to the, um, to the United States. And as she became a young adult, she then entered medical school. She was the first woman to enter medical school for a full medical degree in the United States and the first woman to graduate there. After qualification as a doctor in America, she worked in Paris and also in London. In 1859, she received her place on the British Medical Register. Her place on the British Medical Register meant that she was able to practice here in Britain as a doctor. And this means that many people describe Dr. Blackwell as the first woman doctor. She worked immensely hard to prevent ill health. She worked really hard to improve health and to provide medical care for lots of people. Her work inspired others to follow in her footsteps and to follow in her footsteps to become doctors and to become scientists. She ran public lectures to inform people about prevention of illness and to stimulate discussion about health and well-being. Dr. Blackwell's work really clearly demonstrated her desire to help everyone in society become healthier and she did so on the basis of sound and accurate information. So she did so on the basis of facts. So to me it seems really in keeping with the work that Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell did, that the lecture tonight by Professor Kingori will help us understand more 
about facts, as well as understand more about fakes, fabrication, and falsehoods. Professor Patricia Kingori, our lecturer tonight, is a sociologist. She's Professor of Global Health Ethics at the University of Oxford, where she's also a senior investigator at the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities. She also works in the Ethox Centre in Oxford. She's acted as an advisor on the ethical conduct of research and the ethical conduct of intervention in the UK and internationally. This includes her work in relation to the ethical treatment of frontline healthcare workers. She's given numerous pieces of advice to numerous organizations, including the World Health Organization, Save the Children, the Medical Research Council, Doctors Without Borders, and the Nuffield Council of Bioethics. As if that isn't enough, Patricia's standards of academic excellence were recognized recently in a merit award from the University of Oxford. Her work on facts, fakes, falsehoods, and fabrication has great depth and sophistication. She'll speak with us tonight for about 40 minutes, and she'll talk in depth about her work. She'll then be very happy to answer any of your questions, so please do think about the questions that you'd like to ask during her talk, and then we'll have all those questions at the end. I know we're all really looking forward to this lecture. It's my great pleasure to invite you, Professor Kungori, to give the 10th Elizabeth Blackwell Public Lecture. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. How are you getting on with that silent um, clapping? <laughs> yeah. um, Firstly, thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's a Monday night in January, and when they told me it was sold out, I thought maybe no one would turn up. Well, my nervous self was hoping not many people would turn up. <laughs> so actually, to see a packed room, it's really incredible, um, and thank you so much for coming. And also, before I start, I'd really like to thank the organisers um, who've put in quite a lot of work and time with me to make me feel comfortable. It's my first time in Bristol. Um, <laughs> And um, really, I'm really also grateful to Naomi and Julie, who are here as the uh, interpreters, and grateful to the, to the organizers for actually thinking about making this as inclusive as possible. I think that really means a lot, and it's a really great start. Um, so today, I'm gonna talk about fakes. Um, it's something that people often feel quite strongly about. I'm hoping that today that we can have a, a kind of discussion, a really fruitful discussion afterwards. And what I'm really trying to do is to get us to sort of think about fakes in different ways. So I'm going to start my timer. I've got all sorts happening here. Notes, timer, thingy. I want to say also that everything I say is my own views. So even though I've worked for all of those organisations, this is my position and on my experience. Um, but I suppose the take-home message is that actually fakes aren't just rubbish. They're actually indicators to other things that we should probably be paying more attention to and maybe blind spots that we've got. So if you kind of want to snooze for the next 40 minutes, you can wake up and that, that's the take-home. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So there I am. That's the title. Okay. I want to start off with a little bit about fake art and film, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more and get us to think a little bit more around authenticity. Um, so I'm going to start off with the Museum of Art Fakes. So in the basement of a residential building in Vienna, almost directly across the Hunter's Fasted House, is Vienna's most famous example of um, expressionist, expressionist architecture. It's actually the Falsche Museum the Museum of Art Fakes. I'm actually really fascinated by this place. Right? I think it's really wonderful because the idea of it is to celebrate fake paintings, and in particular, the art forgers who produce these paintings. Um, so in there, they've got you know, famous Vermeer counterfeiters. Um, in particular, they've got Elmer de Hoori, who's believed to be one of the most prolific art fake forgers in history. Um, so some of his kind of imitations include Rembrandts and Picassos, and he sold these to like reputable art galleries all around the world. Um, it's really fascinating that in his kind of heyday, um, one of his paintings, one of his Picassos, went for what would be now $50 million. And there's a, 
argument, and many people think that actually 90% of his, his forgeries are still hanging in galleries now, um, as um, <laughs> what some will say unknown, or others say strategically ignored, expensive forgeries. So um, the Folsha Museum really seeks to celebrate the skill and the technique that's involved in these forgeries and see these fakers as kind of anti-heroes um, who were there to kind of con and trick um, the art world. In doing so, these forgers actually revealed to all of us the ego and the hubris of some of the most foremost experts in the world who believed that they had in front of them these masterpieces that were lost and they were the people who had discovered them. Um, so some of the most famous um, fake pieces on display, um, as I said, were really expensive and in today's money were kind of mind-blowing sums. But actually only to focus on the paintings itself actually kind of limits our focus and our view because actually the level of fakery that's involved is more than just the paintings. Often they had to, um, had to fake all of the paperwork and all the provenance of these paintings, and that's in itself quite fascinating. So a couple of years ago, I did a podcast called Exploring the Genuine Fake, and I interviewed Vernon Rapley, who is the Director of Cultural Heritage at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he was, it was really fascinating, him explaining to me how much forgers actually invent, invest in faking all the paperwork and the provenance of things. They often do that first, even before they even look at painting. They make sure that they have the right letterhead. All of that work goes in first. So what we know is actually that forgers become experts at delivering the types of evidence um, that they think the experts prefer, be it on a particular headed paper from a particular institution, and then it becomes a kind of treasure hunt with the experts, where they plant things so that they know that the expert will find it, and it becomes this interesting, like quite amusing game. I think it's amusing not so much if you're an art gallery that's been conned out of lots of money. Um, knowing that so much deference is actually given to the opinion of one or actually a handful of experts mean that forgers are often well aware that if they're able to convince this small group, they actually have the, a level of of um, authenticity that galleries will, will need. And, these, and this authenticity often remains indefinitely, as in the case of Alma Dahouri. So from this kind of example, and, and really paying attention to a museum of, um, of, of um, art fakes, we start to see that the role of experts is actually quite important, but they can also be easily manipulated. And it gets asked, asks us questions of like, who gets to become an expert and really by what means? Okay, so seven streets away from the Falsha Museum, on the corner of Stadpark, uh, is a meeting point for the walking tour for the Third Man, which was famously filmed on location in Vienna. It's actually supposed to be Britain's most famous and um, popular film, so I'm presuming most people here know what the Third Man's about. Um, directed by Carl Reed and released in 1949, The Third Man is based on a book by Graham Greene, who tells the story of Harry Lyme a racketeer who fakes penicillin in post-war Vienna. Lime played by Orson Welles, lead a gang who stole penicillin um, from a military hospital, which was then fabricated and then resold. The, th the authorities are onto Lime, and so he fakes his death. The film itself centers on a search for Lime through the sewers and through the underground networks of Vienna. And um, the audience uncovers more about Lime as through his close friend visiting Vienna and Lime's Czech's girlfriend, who not only presents a quite complex false persona about Lime, but also provides her with, but Lime provides her with a fake passport to avoid her being deported. Through these characters, the audience is endeared to Lime as this anti-hero. We see no evidence of his crime, only suggestion and rumor, which are discounted by those close to him. What we learn from this kind of film and this example is actually that the fake often exists at time of great social upheaval and where decisions of key institutions in government, for example, governments are seen to be kind of arbitrary and morally questionable. Where there's a trust deficit in institutions, but also fakes tend to not exist in isolation. So we get multiple fakes, the fake passport, the fake penicillin, they often exist in a kind of an ecosystem. One of the things that I think the film has become really famous for is its kind of um, expressionist cinematic tool. 
um, and expressionist movement, which was really important in Germany at the time, was really in reaction to what was seen to be the kind of dehumanizing effects of industrialization. And in art, typically, it had this kind of distorted angles, lighting to generate emotional effects. And I think the value of it is particularly in this film and more generally in relation to discussion about fakes is that it really tried to question, have us question this idea of things being black and white, playing with harsh lighting, and really with this idea of things uh, to challenge our kind of attachment to binary opposites. So the visibility and invis invisibility of Harry Lyme, dark and light, black and white, ideas of real and fake. In addition, the film had um, played a lot with what's known as the Deutsch tilt, which is with the camera screwed at a particular angle, really to convey this sense of moral confusion. Why is he on the run? What is real? What is fake? And then we get the camera panning in on the evidence that his actual penicillin had caused the death of children. So we understand that actually from this movement, from confusion to clarity, we understand that actually fakes aren't just about things that are funny. We understand that actually it's a harsh reality to fakes, that fake medicines kill, this, the penicillin um, also killed. We get to see these different ideas of fakes. We get the good fake, which is the passport given to the girlfriend so that she can leave Russia, and then the bad fakes, the penicillin. So in this one film, it's actually a lot of the themes that are really relevant to this discussion around different types of fakes and different ideas of things not being sort of um, straight in terms of one thing or another thing. So, um, Orson Welles in The Third Man went on to make F for fakes. Um, he was really fascinated by this idea of fakery, as am I. Um, and initially the film was called Truth and Lies. Um, and the, uh, the film actually didn't do very well, it, it bombed, it, it, it did quite badly. Um, but what was interesting about the film was it had Elmer de Hoori in it. So we're going back to the Museum of Art Fakes. Um, and he is, he is interviewed in it and he talks about actually this idea that how do you, his desire really to be known as an artist in his own right, to move out of the shadows of the great masters he imitated and to be given credit for his own skills. He tried quite unsuccessfully to be accepted by the art world and in the film, the Hori openly questions this idea of why his forgeries aren't considered as good as some of the masters, given that they're appreciated and often believed to be genuine. And they had successfully fooled so many um, art experts. So he really had this kind of optimism that, you know, actually, if you hang something in a museum long enough, it becomes real. If the fake exists for long enough, can it possibly become real? Um, so the lingering question really from, from his work is really, who is the authority and the power to say that something is real or fake? Um, who are placed in the shadows and who is described as fake? I mentioned that F for Fakes didn't do very well. It actually bombed and Orson Welles said that actually that the reason why it didn't do so well, particularly in America, was that um, really this idea of, of questioning experts was a problem in America because he felt that um, it was a time where people were brought into the sanctity of experts. So people weren't willing to open up and really question who has the power to tell me that this thing is fake or this thing is real? Um, moving away from um, film for the minute, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the role that comedy has played actually as an important kind of comedy and satire in exploring and thinking about fakes. Um, and moving from, um, yeah, towards the end of the, the 20th century, we've got David E. Jones' Perpetual Motion Machine. I don't know how many of you have heard of this machine. It's really fascinating, the story around it. So perpetual motion is actually scientifically completely impossible. But David E. Jones, E. H. Jones, um, had this idea of inventing something that was essentially designed from its offset to kind of fool the scientific community. He designed a perpetual motion machine telling everybody that it was completely fake. This machine doesn't work. 
And he had almost the opposite problem to Alma Dahori, which is that nobody believed him. So, <laughs> um, he, uh, yeah, so at the, for about 18 months ago, as part of my kind of another podcast, I spoke to a good friend and colleague of his, Martin Polyakov, who is a professor of chemistry at the University of Nottingham. And he was actually a former colleague. And the perpetual motion machine, um, after David died, was left to, um, to Martin. And so I had an opportunity to talk to him. And he was basically explaining that the machine, David had invented the machine as a fake to really push scientists and to really push the way that they think. Well, what was really fascinating was that nobody really believed him and he really struggled saying, look, we all know the laws of physics. Why do you think that this is defying it? And, and yet still, I was really fortunate to have access to some of his archives and all of these letters with him speaking to eminent scientists all around the world. One of them was saying things like, it's impossible, it is a hoax, please move on. <laughs> and <laughs> another, less, another um, uh, communication was him saying, listen, there are lots of other things you can apply yourself to. Please don't waste any more time on this. Apply yourself to things that are actually possible. So what was happening was you have an eminent scientist and a really gifted scientist saying, I've got something here, it works, but it's a fake, and nobody believing him. And he was really trying to get the scientific community to think in a different way, and actually, to this day, there's still, still some people that think there's some sort of secret. Um, in the end, he concluded that um, scientists are some of the easiest people to conjure to fool, because scientists are taught to believe what they observe, and they don't think that nature is going to cheat. We're going to think differently about that by the end of this talk. <laughs> um, so in the last few years, especially in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, we've witnessed an avalanche of fakes and misinformation related to everything from fake vaccine passports to COVID vaccine themselves, and actually the overt questioning of scientists and experts. So whereas in the past, people like Orson Welles were saying we are too invested in, in thinking about and, and deferring power to experts. Actually, we've now got a situation where we're over overtly questioning experts. Um, so, I'm gonna move here. But this has actually caused real issues for us because what happens when the thing that is real and part of established science becomes a thing that we think is fake? And what happens when other people are trying to say that something's real and we won't believe them. So almost the opposite of what um, David E.H. Jones was saying. So I just want to give you a, a really quick case study and we'll keep an eye on, on time as well. Um, I'm Dr. Alyssa Granato. I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Alyssa Granato. Um, so Dr. Alyssa Granato was um, the first person to um, ever, she's an Oxford microbiologist, and she's the first person to volunteer to be part of the um, COVID-19 vaccine trial. Um, on the 25th of April, 2020, um, she woke up to the news that she had sadly passed away. She read that... <laughs> <laughs> she read that the cause of her death was unclear, but learned it had global significance. She was the first person to volunteer for the vaccine trial, as I said, and she had apparently experienced complications um, only, after, only a few hours after receiving the vaccine and sadly died two days later. The news of her death went viral across major social media platforms and was picked up by the mainstream news, including the BBC. Um, friends and families were said to be sad and shocked. <laughs> that morning, um, Dr. Granato took to Twitter to declare, nothing like waking up to a fake article on your death, I'm doing fine. She had dated her t Twitter profile to read 100% alive, but the rebuttal was just evidence for many that, in fact, it was a conspiracy designed to conceal her death to the public. She made a fatal mistake. I wonder how many of you can spot it in this picture. She had just got a new cat, which she posted online as something cute, 
Unfortunately for her, many people thought this was Schrodinger's cat. I don't know how many <laughs> people were simultaneously dead and alive. And, and I had interpreted this as some sort of clue. Um, so her tweets declaring herself to be alive and well were read as a familiar tactic of any government cover-up, the denial. There she's on the BBC. There. Today, actually, her death life gives a fascinating insight into the strength of conspiracy theories and the idea about collusions between big pharma governments and powerful elites who skew systems, institutions, and processes to produce fake narratives, or um, either of safety or undermine proven theories and, and safe medicines. Um, Alyssa featured her. I actually met her. I can tell you, she is alive. And I met with her. She was on the podcast I did. And what's really fascinating was that she's really like one of life's sort of chirpy, upbeat people, which I think was an amazing thing. Because if she wasn't, I'm not quite sure how somebody else would respond to this kind of deluge of um, information about them being dead. I mean, there's still people who think she's dead now. This lovely image is one of the paintings that she's been sent. She regularly gets sent paintings. This one of her um, looking kind of, you don't know if the color shown was kind of purpley, like she's dead, basically. Um, and, you know, we laughed about, well, if she's dead, why would you keep sending this? But she gets sent um, messages still on her, the, the anniversary of her death. Um, and all of these messages saying things like, you know, we wish you could have saved you and from all around the world. So there's still, there's a whole Facebook page dedicated to her and trying to make her into a saint and not letting the people in power, you know, forget that she, she died. Um, they're re it's really difficult to dispel um, these kinds of stories. And what was really fascinating to me was I spent more time looking at death hoax is that they don't just land randomly, they do disproportionately affect women in particular, um, politicians, celebrities, and scientists. And unbeknownst to um, Alyssa, she, this, she got caught up in this thing and, and is still now trying to disprove people who think she's dead. Apparently she turns up to conferences and people sort of, you know, still are like, ah, oh. um, here she is. Um, I also wanted to just include something, an uh, email that I've been sent, um, which I find to this day really fascinating, not least because it's, I'm supposed to be part of this kind of conspiracy theory, which is going on without me knowing about it, apparently. Um, but one of the things about this is they're actually really hard to dispel because, yes, I was a member of the stage committee and um, I am funded by the Wellcome Trust and... Um, I am at Oxford, which is where, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine was. But I've never had a conversation with anyone about vaccine passports or um, any of these other things. I'm not part of a cabal. But for people who want to think that you are, it's really difficult to disprove it. Um, and another thing, I mean, I've, I've presented this before, but it always makes me laugh, this email, because it's a very, very British thing which is that they can't, you know, you've said something really, accused me of quite, of quite strong things in this, but no, 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 no one's going to say that they've got bad manners. I'm going to leave with have a lovely weekend at the end, <laughs> you know. <laughs> just, you know, just so that no one can... <laughs> um, anyway, conspiracy theories, I think, which I've been the subject of and other people have been the subject of, just this is a kind of working definition and I think it's really important, actually, because we often describe them in really pejorative ways, um, and the people who believe in conspiracy theories are often dismissed as kind of lunatics and people on the fringes and not quite there. But actually, it's really difficult to unpick what is or isn't a conspiracy theory. Um, and often it's the passage of time, but even sometimes in real time, people are saying things are going on that we don't want to believe and we find hard to, um, to, to take seriously. So here's just some examples of people who at the time were told that they were part of conspiracy theories. And, and um, we were talking earlier about the latest kind of post office scandal with the kind of sub post, post um, office masters. Um, all of these people were told they're conspiracy theorists. And so it makes it really hard sometimes for us to 
um, know where we are in relation to what's true and what's false, what to believe, what to dismiss. Um, and often it reveals a, a kind of a power. Who gets the power to say that what somebody believes is a conspiracy theorist and who gets the power to say that this is fake? And so this is often where we find ourselves in this space of not being sure and it's a very uncomfortable space. And what then do we rely on to give us a sense of authenticity or a sense of something is real or fake? Um, speaking about conspiracy theories, I wanted to talk about one last film, which is Dying to Survive. Um, don't know if you've seen it, but it's been really critically acclaimed. It's a comedy, again. Um, uh, so it's a 2018 uh, Chinese film. It tells the story of a small um, drugstore owner called Cheng, who becomes this uh, exclusive agent of this um, really in-demand leukemia drug in China. Really expensive, out of the reach of most people. Um, so with these sort of Chinese patients kind of suffering overpriced medication from this Swiss pharmaceutical company, um, Cheng grows in wealth and stature by smuggling in um, these drugs, um, which are described as fakes in India. Um, Chen is initially presented as this kind of deadbeat dad, a bit of a joke, but he goes on to find himself being the saviour of all these thousands of people. Um, so I don't know, at the back you can see the priest. The priest becomes really important. He becomes a kind of everyman in the film to really help us through this. So in the beginning, he's, he acts as our kind of moral barometer, right? So he provides us with this sense of what's right and wrong. At the beginning, he's really against Chang selling the medicines. He thinks it's illegal, he thinks it's wrong. But over time, he starts to change his position and asks, what's, what is wrong if it's saving lives? Um, and so we start to see that actually the priest himself starts selling this drug. Um, and we, we see that actually the fakes in this space is a kind of a social justice, has a really strong social justice argument. That often the people who say that something is real are often the people that are stopping these things from having mass appeal or mass access. Um, so throughout, we see the pricing of medicines as, as being immoral, and the real fakery is actually that these medicines are created as so expensive and out of reach, and they don't need to be. Um, so in a way, we're left with this kind of quite riveting and deeply morally ambiguous kind of story. But like The Third Man, Dying to Survive is actually based on a true story. Um, and um, the, the real, the, in the real life, uh, Lu Wang, a Chinese leukemia patient, smuggled the, the medicines through and then became this kind of hero. So, I mean, uh, this takes us to this really interesting place, um, which, people, which uh, Peter Panoramchev has spoken about which is this idea of soft facts and hybrid facts. Increasingly, it's actually no longer whether something is real or fake, but whether something is plausible. Is it plausible that a group of pharmaceutical companies can get together, fix the price, and stop people dying from cancer to get access to those medicines? If we think it is, then that's often enough, according to this argument, that because there's such a trust deficit in institutions, we're actually no longer often accepting what they say in face value, especially when it goes against what we can see ourselves and what we can observe. So then the question is, how do we get access to the truth? Is it just what we see? And that's also then itself quite problematic. So the truth itself is often quite hard to find, and this makes things even more complicated and have real world consequences. Um, we no longer trust many of the scientific journals, many of the things that we feel that are were often the kind of pillars and proxies to truth themselves have become really questionable. And I think that in this space of half-truths and hybrid facts, there is this kind of uncertainty that we often feel that we, have, we can't 100%, we need lots of different ways to verify things, no, not just one. So where does this leave us? Um, really, it leaves us in a space where Institutions and experts are forced to be more transparent and honest about conflicts of interests, honest about things that they agree or disagree with. Um, all of the fakes have really questions of who gets to be the expert and ultimately who and what can we trust. 
And fakes are just an indicator, and our concerns about fakes are just an indicator, really, about things like access either to medicines or to institutions themselves, um, indicator of the kind of quality of information that we've received, uh, indicator of whether we trust experts or not, or whether what they're doing is enough to make us feel that they're trustworthy. Um, and really, often the governments aren't really seen to protect the poor against um, big corporations, which makes it really then plausible for us to think that they're capable of almost anything. And I think once, when there's that trust deficit, it kind of leaves that door open for all sorts of other things. Um, what I'm really keen to do is to really think through some of the sort of different ethical implications and the different types of fakes and what's at stake in all these different types of fakes. Because some of them, for example, you know, a fake handbag, we might actually be quite, you know, think that's a great thing. I mean, wow, it looks really great. We might feel quite differently if it's like a fake doctor or a fake uh, medicine. So I think one of the other things that fake really, fakes really allow us to see is the role of kind of vantage points and the observer's perspective. Who gets to say that something's fake? Who gets to be accused of being fake? Um, and what do we consider real? And um, what do we consider fake or even shadowy? So I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patricia. What a tour de force and lots and lots of food for thought. So yeah. I'm expecting a lot of questions from the audience. And I know that you're very happy to take questions yeah, yeah. tonight. So, so thank you very much. Lo lots of food for thought. And I'm thinking about who decides who is an expert, who makes a decision about authenticity, and all the ways in which that those decisions and people play out in society and possibly some of the inequalities that flow from the work that you've talked about today, the insight yeah. that you've given us today. So thank you. Let's see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, folks, we're looking forward to your questions. Fantastic. I'll just wait for a few hands to go up. And I might take a few questions at, at once. There's a person wearing, I think, a stripy T-shirt here. So could we take that question first? I think we might have roving mics. <laughs> Fabulous. I wonder if there's a chance to have a bit more light in the room as well. Thank you, that was fantastic. And I've got so many thoughts going around my head, I don't know if I'll be able to articulate a sensible question. Um, but it's about, and Rachel, you touched on this, who decides who's an expert? Because arguably, the guy who was doing all the, the fake art at the beginning that you talked about, you know, there was great expertise there in researching the document trail and, and, and creating a forgery that's so believable. You know, in his own right, that makes him an artist and an expert, but what, what's made, who's decided that he's on the wrong side of, you know, fact or false, and his is the forgery and not, not true art? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a question of our time, especially as we start to become, um, you know, often not as confident in the institutions that decide whether somebody is an expert or not. Um, and... Um, there was a really great story I was told about a patient who was um, in, a, in a kind of uh, mental health facility and he had a particular ritual with his medicines where he would rub them in one hand once and then rub ten times each time. And um, on one occasion, some of the colour, the ink from the, um, the medicines came off in his hand and he refused to touch it. He wouldn't have it, wouldn't take any of his medicines, got very upset. But the nurses all kind of, I'm really touched by this story because they know all the people, all of the, really believed in him and went off and checked the batch number and they said, no, it's real, you know, it's fine. And he still wouldn't take it and they investigated it further and they found out he was in fact correct, that he had medicines that weren't, that were, that weren't real. Um, and so he was an expert of his own health and he kind of knew enough about how the medicines should look. He took them all the time, had his little ritual. Um, so I think... It, hopefully, some of this discussion allows us to at least consider different types of expertise alongside each other. I'm not saying they're equivalent, 
but I think that actually um, it does allow for our own experiences sometimes to have weight um, instead of a kind of always deferring to somebody when sometimes they've got different types of expertise in a particular thing. Thank you. There's lots more questions, so I'm sorry if I'm taking you out of order. There's a person there in the sweatshirt, and maybe we'll take that with another question as well. So the person with the sweatshirt and then the person with the dark polar neck. So we'll take two questions together. Good evening. Oh, that was louder than I expected. <laughs> um, thank you for that talk. That was great and very thought-provoking. So mine is about powerful statistical algorithms um, that we refer to as AI, and ultimately those are going to be the things that are deciding what's right and wrong, apparently, in the future, and how do we safeguard against that? So AI, that, it's fine if your question isn't about AI. <laughs> Do I have to do anything? Oh, no. Hello. Uh, thank you. Um, really provocative. And what was burning in my head was, and I wonder if you've come across it, is, um, is it Robert Whittaker in the States um, work in um, mental health specific specifically and challenging the DSM, the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual? Uh, to me, it, it's a classic example of... of uh, uh, well, how can I put it tactfully? Um, science that has been sh shapen or science that has been manufactured to create a norm. And um, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? I don't, but I'm really fascinated by it because I think it's... Um, I mean, I, I understand the concept, but I don't know the specific example that you've... I mentioned. have many. Okay. Um, I'd be really <laughs> happy to talk to you. Yeah. No, this is good. I mean, this is kind of why I like doing these sorts of discussions. Okay. Um, shall I speak about the AI question? Yeah. I've been doing some work, I mean, we were just having a kind of conversation earlier, which is this project's supposed to be four years and I'm supposed to be winding down, it's my last year, but then AI, sort of like, I'm like, I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my life. But um, I'm really fascinated by AI, especially because of the amount of deference that people give to it. So I've done some work on AI hallucinations. I don't know if you know much about AI hallucinations, but they're essentially really, really plausible things that can happen. So you put in, I don't know, if you put your name in and see what comes out the other side, it's like 90% true, but then it'll be this other stuff that's just like, where does this come from? And it's kind of a bit of a joke at first, except that if you put in African doctors, you'll get a picture of an elephant in an in a operating theatre because they don't have many pictures of African doctors. So it just makes things up and it generates things that kind of look real you need to have a really discerning eye to be able to spot that it's in fact a complete fake. And we've kind of joked around with this and in our office and stuff. And then one, one colleague had put his name in and he'd put, you know, so and so, um, Professor Lala, done this, this, and this. And then it put, sadly died in 2021. <laughs> He's still alive. But he'd, he'd just stopped publishing in 2021. And so the question is, what do we do? to address this. I'm really interested in AI hallucinations because at the moment, it seems to be a way that um, the owners of AI, like OpenAI, get to not take any responsibility for what's produced because they say, well, it was just an in internet that, you know, so-and-so is a paedophile. It's not our fault if we reproduce it. And this person has, it has enormous consequences, but without any responsibility. And also, how do you change it? Who do you go to? Who do you complain to? if it produces these, these falsehoods. So it's a real, um, it's a real issue. It's, it produces all sorts of things. You can ask it to, you know, I've, I've looked at it and it's produced, I know The Guardian has had lots of issues with it because it produces really realistic and plausible articles that are not written by The Guardian at all. Um, but they, you know, most of us don't have the resources to take on a big company like OpenAI. So we're really relying on, on watching these cases closely to see what's going to happen, because if it writes falsehoods about us, we are kind of a bit stuffed, really. Um, that's not the scientific sort of definition. <laughs> we're, we're in trouble. So. <laughs> Thank you. And then let's wrap your question into this person in the red jacket with a microphone. The microphone's coming. Okay. Yep. Can everyone hear me? It's coming your way. There we are. Okay. 
Okay, so I have two questions. One is to the fake museum, because you told all of these documents, but they need to put in are fake. Mm -hmm. Do they get, get into prison for these things? Could I, sorry? sorry? To take into court because they're faking a document, it's illegal? Yeah, no, I mean, the whole thing's so illegal. How do they get sued? <laughs> Well, I think the, are you talking about the museum itself? Yes. These are often retrospective things and cases that are known. So they've often already been through court. I mean, Alma Dahori served time in prison. Um, so it's a kind of known fakes that we're aware of. It's not like they're, they're not exposing people who aren't known. And they're also retrospective, um, uh, retrospective. I mean, they're kind of one of Britain's most famous um, art forgers at the moment who's still alive, he has sort of pivoted and done a really sort of entrepreneurial thing. He now paints for people who want to have their Picasso but don't want it hanging in their walls, so he does lots of those sort of replicas. Um, but he doesn't need to fake anymore, he just sort of does it. So is that just what reality are? Yeah, well, according to, Al fake it to, uh, according to Alma Dahuri, there's still, uh, and the people that know his work, there's still, um, I mean, every year they uncover another one of his paintings. They recently uncovered a Monet that was one of his. That um, They're all on, in galleries, no one knows, because the point, I mean, this is the whole point about the deference, which is that you, if you just get one expert to say this is 100% a Picasso, un unless there's a technology, and un actually, firstly, unless there's a suspicion that it's not a technology, so someone has to suspect it's not, and then they have to have the technology to tell you it's not. And sometimes that can take years. I mean, the only person who does know what is real or fake is a person who makes it, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to try and take you in order. There is um, a person who's been very patient at the back. I think he's wearing a white jumper or a white scarf. Yes, that's you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for this uh, great talk. Um, first of recommendation, I'm sure you know it already, but the documentary Sour Grapes is fascinating. It's about the wine forgery in the wine world, and it talks about quite a few of the points that you talk about. What is expertise? What, yeah. what is a good wine and everything? How do you fake a wine? It's really lovely. Um, I, had, I think I read correctly, but do tell me if I'm wrong. You, so you said that the... Um, that women are most often targeted by fake news or fake information about them. And then I think you said, you, or that it was also written that women are also often the targets of the fake, as in the yeah. targeted audience for it. Is, if so, I read correctly, could yeah, you tell Yeah, so that often that? death hoax, you know, the sort of, the Alyssa Granato story, um, that's more likely to happen to women. And all the narrative around it, you know, well, you kind of, it's almost a kind of little Red Riding Hood thing. You ventured too far off. Look at you thinking you could be a scientist. These things happen. Oh, well, sorry, you're dead. You know, those kinds of stories. Um, I wasn't aware of this when I first started doing this work, but there's a really strong sort of gender element to some of these things. Um, and also, if you look at, from one of the things we've learned from a lot of the COVID misinformation was that if you're a woman, you were disproportionately more likely to be targeted. So you were more likely to get in your WhatsApp message a fake story than men. Um, so that's one of the interesting sort of findings that's come out of the work is how this doesn't just, these fakes don't just land randomly. They actually can be quite sort of targeted. Um, then there's... Uh person with um, wearing a dark clothes with glasses. Yes, you've just turned around. Yes. Brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Hi, thanks. That was really interesting. Um, I just had a couple of recommendations, actually. I don't know if you've watched the Adam Curtis documentaries on BBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he talks a lot about um, the rise in conspiracy yeah. as a political use of warfare, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. And you see he talks about how Putin, for example, pushes out a lot of misinformation via Twitter on lots of various different accounts um, and that people um, are influenced by social media in terms of the rise in the conspiracy, which I think is really interesting. But one of the things that I think I've observed in people, rather than us judging the other person as being the expert, but I think that a lot of people reading a lot of misinformation take themselves as being the expert. Um, 
which I think is part of the issue because they're not potentially experts in reading a lot of different like publication or scientific kind of methods or anything. A lot of it is just argument, conjecture, really. Um, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on sort of that rise in conspiracy social media influence. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a really good um, observation. And yeah, I mean, Adam Kirsten's work is fantastic. I think um, it's really, again, not worth dismissing fake news, at least as a medium, because actually if you look at the way that they're, they're able to often in a WhatsApp message boil down really quite nuanced things into really quite easily digestible things, I think... You know, I think as an academic, I've got to look, I can learn a thing or two about how to sort of communicate in such <laughs> clear, less verbose ways. But, um, you know, if you get over the space of six weeks, um, a m similar messages telling you more or less the same thing, and everybody in your circle gets similar message in this really kind of concise way, mm -hmm. after a while, I think not only do you start to think that you know, so therefore you're the expert, but you also start to feel that this thing might well be true. And I think that's essentially what's happening. And I think looking at some of these troll farms and the way that these kinds of um, social media has been used as a kind of political weapon, I think is also really fascinating. But again, this, it's, all, it's disproportionate. So certain people are more likely to receive um, that kind of fake news um, via social media than other people. Um, and it's all to do with our algorithms and the amount of information that we give over about ourselves when we're signing up to these things um, that allows them then to be really focused and targeted. Um, so we all operate in these kinds of silos um, based on, on, in social media based on um, the, you know, the kind of what we like and the information we give, we're more likely to get certain types of fake news, I think. Thank you. And there's a person at the front in the orange scarf who's been very patient. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you very much. I um, really appreciated that. And I identified with a number of things to do with the access to medicines, which we're talking about, particularly in um, lower and middle income countries. I work in the area of cancer, and running a large cancer support group opened my eyes to the number of people who are out there deliberately trying to target vulnerable people by selling them fakes as cancer cures. And some of these, you know, we know absolutely a complete fake, but they're, you just need one person who um, has survived cancer. They may have had surgery, chemotherapy, but also mistletoe extract, and it was the mistletoe extract that cured them. Um, they're convinced of it, and they become part of that whole thing. So anybody who has um, cancer, you know, they're looking for that absolute cure and they'll pick up on those things and they're so hard to convince people that all these all these uh, cancer cures that they're being targeted with are actually fakes how, how does one develop a strategy to to defeat that <laughs> and that's quite a complicated question but i think actually i'd kind of want to take a couple of steps back and looking at i mean you said that you you know, um, we do a lot of work in low-middle-income countries, and I think, you know, some of the places I've worked, specifically in East Africa, there just isn't this idea that African people get cancer. And so there is such a huge amount of fake chemotherapy, and the problem for the doctor, because it's just a supply and demand thing, people need chemotherapy, there isn't enough, they buy in the fake stuff. The problem is, is that chemotherapy is horrendous. It makes you feel terrible. And it makes you feel, you know. And so how do you discern fake chemotherapy from real chemotherapy if they both have really similar symptoms? And a lot of this, and why I'm really interested in the fake, is that it points us to blind spot. Why aren't we taking access to cancer medicine seriously? Nobody thinks they're taking anything fake. They want to take something that's going to make them feel better. They want it as cheaply as possible. They don't want to think that actually them being terminally ill is helping massive pharmaceutical companies make billions every year. And, it, and they think that that's morally wrong. And until that is corrected, there is always going to be people who are going to exploit the fact that these medicines are way too expensive and people need access to them cheaper. So actually, 
in a way, if you want the real, you just have to make it something that people can get without you know, having to sell their homes and be in debt to get. I think that's the start. If people feel they can get that, they don't really want to try anything else. I think that's where a lot of the trust is eroded because somebody's selling you something in a moment of complete desperation when you're faced with a terminal illness that means indebting your family you know, for generations, basically. Um, and I had no idea how expensive cancer treatment was um, until I started doing some of this work. And it's just incredible and ask questions as to why. You know, why does it need to be that way? So it's just really like removing all the emotion is just a really simple economic supply and demand. You're going to give people what they want. If not, they're going to try and find it elsewhere. And that's where some of these um, more, you know, untested uh, treatments come in often. Thank you. I think we have time for, I think, one more question. I think we'll try and take something from further back. And I'm sorry that we won't get the chance to answer all the questions. Could I ask the person in the black sweater, I think? <laughs> sorry if I get your clothing choices wrong, folks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned East Africa, and last week I was in Tanzania. Uh, and I'm a dentist working with a charity that deals with this uh, infant oral mutilation where local uh, healthcare workers, local um, healers will say that removing tooth buds will stop children getting infections. Uh, and that actually results in them getting an infection that they can die from. And this kind of um, practice is, is happening because this myth is, is being propagated. So what's your perspective and advice in dealing with that kind of situation? Um, I think these kind of myths, you know, are really um, dangerous, obviously. I mean, I think it's, you know, I think that's quite sort of straightforward. Um, I, but I think actually, it, for me, as a sociologist, I'm really interested in understanding why those myths exist. Why, you know, what, what is it that um, has led to these things happening in the first place? Um, and what is it that means that actually they're so persistent? Um, so in lots of the areas where I work and I do clinical trials, there's this, often this myth of the kind of the blood-stealing Western doctor that comes in, steals African blood, and sort of takes it on a plane and sort of, you know, revitalizes, you know, white people. Um, and it's not really about... They don't... I mean, when you get to the bones of it, I don't think it's really about that. It's actually about the fact that these myths often show us um, to places where we don't want to think about. So often they're thinking, you know, where is the money being made here? You know, who are these people and why are they here? And how do we understand what they're doing? Because they're not, the ways that they're explaining things to me, I don't really understand. So I'm going to construct this myth because actually this myth about them coming and taking stuff from us and taking it makes more sense because that's what's kind of happened. And so often, again, like um, all rumours, they're often a way for people who haven't got lots of power to try and get power, um, to try and destabilise things, to raise suspicions, to say, hey, maybe we need to think about this in a different way. So I don't know how to fix that specific myth, but I think actually myths and rumours are really important. I mean, there's a whole kind of anthropology and sociology of rumours. spend a lot of time looking at them because they're not really what they appear to be. They're often a, a vessel and a vehicle for concerns generally about like structural things or things that people are kind of unhappy with that they want attention to. So in that particular case, I don't really know enough about the context, but I think, yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound like a good situation. <laughs> thank you very much. And, and thank you everyone for all of your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get the chance to put them all to uh, Patricia. Um, Patricia, we'd like to thank you again uh, for your talk and for the insight you've provided to us. As a note of thanks, we've got a little something to give you now. Um, wow. Thank you. Thank you. So this is from us at the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute oh, for you. Health Research. And it's to say oh, thank wow. you. 
Thank you. I'm scared I won't break it. <laughs> Where's that bobber wrap? We've got a safe box for you to take <laughs> it home with. Um, <laughs> and it's purchased um, by virtue of a very generous well, donation that was given to the Institute by descendants of Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. So thank you very much oh, thank indeed. You all. Thank, thank you all. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to invite everybody now to carry on the conversation in the foyer. We're offering a soft drink reception. We've got the room until 8 o'clock, so please do enjoy. I'm going to put on screen our social media handles. Feel free to follow us. Thank you.